This video will cover the units featured in Game Boy Wars 3, the differences from their Advance Wars counterparts, what they promote into, and provide general advice for use in the campaign mode. Note that promoted units are never used outside campaign mode unless pre-deployed by the map itself. Take note that ground units are divided into two types, armored and unarmored. This is important because a number of weapons are made for attacking one or the other. Also keep in mind that the current menu patch renames many units to reference a real-world plane or tank, so I will list their names from that patch when necessary to avoid confusion. One of the most basic units in the game, the infantry does not differ much from its Advanced Wars counterpart. It moves three spaces, has a weak machine gun, and captures properties. It doesn't promote. While the infantry is the cornerstone of your army in Advance Wars, it doesn't really have the same level of importance in Game Boy Wars 3. This is due to the other common foot soldier being much more cost-effective. The mech is a more powerful foot soldier. It moves two spaces and can capture like the infantry. The big difference between this and the infantry is the bazooka. Unlike in Advance Wars, the mech is a ranged unit, able to fire at armored units from two tiles away or when counter-attacking. However, they only carry one round, so after they've fired their bazooka, they have to get supplies from a city, factory, or supply truck in order to fire again. This is definitely the preferred foot soldier, since it can fire that bazooka after leaving any transporter. The range and attack power is excellent for eliminating problematic units, and the mech itself is not that expensive. It doesn't promote, but a mech at the max level packs quite a punch in its single shot. The Constructor is a bulldozer with quite a number of terraforming abilities. It can repair damaged properties and develop them to increase income. It can also pave roads at the same time as a move action, it can build bridges, it can clear away forests and wastelands, and it can build the Runway, which is an airport that can supply air units but can't produce or repair them. Needless to say, the ability to increase your income is going to be the ability you want this unit for, though the other abilities serve their own niches depending on the map. Therefore, it's worth having a couple of these around to develop your starting buildings before moving them towards key areas on the map. The supply truck is what you'll use to get more fuel and ammo to your ground units and helicopters. If a unit hasn't taken its turn and is adjacent to a supply truck, it can get refueled as a free action, as stated in the previous video. The supply truck can promote into an upgraded supply truck if it levels up in the campaign, which will give it more chances to refuel units before having to go back and restock at a factory. It can't refuel itself in a city. This is a pretty good unit to have near your main forces when the action really starts. Helicopters especially need a quick way to get more fuel and ammo when they eventually run out. This is the unit to have waiting to do just that. However, only one or two of them are really necessary to get the job done. The most basic and inexpensive transporter unit, the transport truck moves foot soldiers across the ground. It can carry one foot soldier and move seven spaces and has very weak attack and defense. When leveled up, it can promote into a stronger truck that is equipped with a cannon. This unit moves the farthest out of all ground transporters, and promoting doesn't change that, but the cannon isn't really appealing as anything but a self-defense option. The difference between this and the APC is that this unit doesn't handle planes well, but you can load it onto the transport plane. It's up to you which you use, this or one of the other transporters. The combat buggy is a car unit equipped with grenades. It moves seven spaces and its grenades do a number on unarmored vehicles and infantry, but it only has two grenade shots before it has to refuel. When it promotes, it switches out the grenades for an anti-tank cannon. This is a pretty basic and inexpensive attacking unit, kind of okay in the early game, but as the game goes on, the weak defenses of the combat buggy, even when promoted, makes it harder to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with tanks. You'll probably want to bench them in the later parts of the game. The Battle Car is another car unit. This one's equipped with an anti-tank cannon from the get-go and moves seven spaces. Not a lot more to say, except they can promote into an even more powerful car. However, the added attack and defense reduces the movement by one. Like with the Combat Buggy, this unit is very simple to use, and also like the Combat Buggy, it starts becoming less useful as the game focuses more on the Air Force. Weak defenses also make it more of a glass cannon than I would like. 
The classic armored personnel carrier, though of course this one doesn't supply. It's got a lot of defense, carries one foot soldier, and moves six bases. Not much else to it besides the machine gun. When it promotes, the machine gun gets swapped out for an anti-tank missile. This one packs a punch! This is not a unit I like using much. The transport truck gets the job done and has more movement while being cheaper, and there's another unit that is basically the APC but better. I would pass on this unit entirely. The rocket truck is the first indirect unit we're looking at. This unit fires rockets and unarmored units at 2 to 3 range, with a movement of 5 spaces. If leveled up and promoted, the range of the rocket increases to 3 to 4 spaces, but the movement of the unit drops to 4 spaces, so you're trading movement for being able to fire from farther away. Even though indirects move and fire in the same turn in this game, this isn't really a unit I've used much due to the low range and it attacks unarmored units, which plenty of other units can accomplish. The promotion isn't really that huge an upgrade. The Anti-Air Tank Unit. It possesses a Vulcan cannon that rips air units apart, and its machine gun does a number on unarmored land units as well. It moves 5 spaces and does not promote, but it's still a powerful unit. Anti-air forces are going to be imperative to surviving some of the insane air battles in this game. This unit is perfect for that, and I recommend including a half dozen or so in your army despite the lack of a promotion. The missile is an indirect anti-air missile unit, with a movement of 5 spaces and a range of 2 to 3 spaces. It deals great damage to air units, but can't fire on anything else. If you level it up and promote it, movement drops to 4 spaces, but range extends to a massive 4 to 6 spaces with a hefty amount of damage as well. Quite possibly the definitive anti-air unit. The initial range might look like junk, but keep in mind both the promotion and the fact that units in this game move and fire in the same turn. You can shoot down planes before they have a chance to hurt you with this, just as long as you keep it away from enemy ground forces because they're vulnerable and can't fight back on their own. The Artillery is a powerful ranged cannon. This one can put decent damage into any ground unit and can even damage some navy units. It moves 4 spaces and has a surprisingly long range of 2 to 5 spaces. When it promotes, its movement drops to 3 spaces, but the range extends to 3 to 6 spaces. That seems to be a trend with Indrex. This is a unit I underestimated simply because I always deal with ground units by using air units, but the artillery can be an effective way to snipe out enemy anti-air units so that your own air units aren't threatened. You have to use them often to level them up though since indirects can't counterattack. The infantry fighting vehicle is a hybrid unit, capable of carrying a foot soldier and heavily armored to protect it. It moves 6 spaces and has a powerful anti-tank cannon, whose range actually extends from 1 space to 1 to 2 spaces when it promotes. Now, After watching Pentagon Wars, I can't help but joke about this thing being junk, but I actually don't think it's terrible. Carrying a foot soldier means it can gain EXP without fighting, and gaining range upon promotion is also excellent. It handles ground terrain just fine, but has one less movement than the transport truck. As stated before, it's pretty much up to you. Use the transport truck or use the infantry fighting vehicle. But avoid APCs, they're really not worth it. The small tank is a ground vehicle that is pretty much the equivalent of the Advanced Wars tank. It's armored, moves 6 spaces, and is built to fire on other armored ground units. Upon promoting, its attack and defense go up, and its range extends from 1 space to 1 to 2 spaces, letting it fire on armored units without getting counterattacked. Another unit that I've mostly ignored, since air units or artillery get the job done just as well, and it doesn't have the additional utility of other units like the IFV from earlier. Can't imagine it offers all that much more either. The large tank is the biggest and bulkiest tank in the game. Well, second biggest, actually. It moves five spaces and has an anti-tank cannon. Not much else to say here. Unfortunately, this thing isn't much more than a giant glacier, something you distract the enemy with, and boy does the enemy have it a lot. I'd pass on this one. Fighter A is the basic fighter jet unit, capable of firing missiles at other air units in direct combat. It also has a machine gun for dealing a modest amount of damage to unarmored ground units. It moves a huge 12 spaces and does not promote. 
This is a pretty good unit for non-campaign maps, since those don't let you promote anything. However, units with promotion potential are preferred within campaign mode, even if you have to deal with them being weak for a little while. Fighter A at least carries a lot of fuel in the tank, so it doesn't have to worry about gas that much. Fighter B is a slightly weaker and less expensive jet fighter. It moves 11 spaces, carries a little less fuel and has a weaker missile, however the advantage it has over Fighter A is that it can promote into the incredibly awesome Fighter S. Fighter S is a monster of a jet with the highest movement in the game at 13 spaces and it carries a ranged missile launcher that can fire at air units from 3 to 5 spaces away. That's right, Fighter B promotes into an indirect air unit. For that reason, I always raise several Fighter B units in the campaign. Boy do I wish this unit could be in other modes. Fighter S is powerful, so it stands that you face legions of them in the campaign mode. Of course, in any jet battle, it's all about who fires on who first, so strike first while the iron is hot, as they say. Attacker A is your standard bomber plane. It moves 11 spaces and can drop bombs on ground units for quite a bit of damage. It also has a machine gun for dealing minor damage to most other unit types. Unfortunately, it carries a low amount of fuel and ammo. I rarely use this plane due to the ammo problem. It runs out rather quickly and it's expensive to maintain. I prefer other units over this one, but it doesn't promote, so I suppose nothing's wrong with it outside campaign mode. Attacker B is a Harrier of sorts. This unit is interesting in that it's a low-flying plane, which means it can get fuel from the supply truck rather than the supply plane. It moves 9 spaces and can deal decent damage to most ground units. Just pay close attention to its fuel tank, because it burns through fuel rather quickly. This plane can be promoted into Attacker S, a stealth bomber with a unique ability. It can completely ignore the zone of control mechanic, letting it escape from enemy groups quickly, especially since it moves 10 spaces now. If you can handle the unit's fuel problems, Attacker B is not a bad unit, and the promotion is definitely an upgrade worth going for. Even in air battles, being able to slip past enemy jets and get behind them lets your fighters pull off pincer attacks with ease. One or two of these is not a bad addition to your army. This very expensive bomber is not for attacking enemies directly. Instead, it's used to destroy terrain. When you open the bay doors, the tile you're flying over and the six adjacent tiles are all hit with a bomb. Forced tiles become planes, planes and roads become wastelands, and buildings lose 15 capture points, becoming wrecked buildings if they hit zero. Units will take one or two points of damage depending on if they're armored or not. This unit does not promote. This unit has a number of niche applications. Bombing out enemy buildings removes their income quicker than capturing it all, and you can stall them by creating worse terrain they have to cross. Heck, you can have a pair of tactical bombers hover over the enemy HQ and blast its capture points down to one, then have a T-copter with an infantry swoop in for the capture. Just remember to have other air units ready to clear you a path. Anyways, one or two of these isn't a bad idea. The transport plane is a plane with no attack capabilities and no promotion. The purpose of this unit is to transport your ground units. It moves 8 spaces and can carry any two unarmored ground units. Infantry, constructors, and cars, but no tanks. Now this is a unit I wish I had in Advance Wars. The applications are many. You can carry your foot soldiers to capture things or carry your constructors and even the supply trucks to where they need to be. It moves farther than a T-copter, though with no weapon of its own, it can't defend itself when it unloads on the front lines. I prefer using one or two of these in addition to my T-copters. The supply plane carries fuel to your plane units. That's really all there is to it. It moves 9 spaces and does not promote. Naturally, this is the fastest way to get fuel to your air units when needed, as having a constructor build a runway takes longer, but the supply plane itself has to get more fuel from somewhere too, so have a runway or airport ready for it. This unit is essential to any air force, so keep at least one alive with you. The Battlecopter is a helicopter unit, which means unlike planes, it needs a supply truck, not a supply plane, to refuel. It moves 6 spaces and packs a decent amount of punch against most ground units, but keep it far away from those anti-air units. 
When it promotes, its movement increases to 7 spaces and its range increases from 1 space to 1 to 2 spaces. This is one of the most cost effective units in the entire game, and I always have a pack of them in my army. Great overall damage on ground units, coupled with a promotion that lets them eliminate those pesky anti-air units safely, I am game for that. Its weapon runs out of ammo fast though, especially when promoted, so have a supply truck ready to refuel it. Overall, a really great unit in all modes of play. The Anti-Sub Helicopter is a very strange unit. This is a helicopter built to attack Navy units. In particular, its air-to-sea torpedo is the only way to attack a submarine without using your own submarine. It moves six spaces and does not promote. This is another unit I almost never use, because attacking Navy units with an air unit is impractical. To deal with enemy submarines, I just use submarines. This unit also has little utility outside of its primary purpose, so just forget about it. The Transport Copter is a helicopter unit that carries your foot soldiers and is armed with a machine gun for dealing with unarmored ground units. It moves 7 spaces and can carry 1 unit. When it promotes, movement decreases to 6 spaces, but it gains the ability to carry 2 units instead of 1, and it gains an anti-tank cannon. The cannon fires only one time before it has to reload, and is a direct fire weapon. Though the transport plane is faster and carries more types of units, the T-Copter is inexpensive to maintain and has some extra firepower options, especially when it promotes. Until you have enough income to support transport planes and can defend them, it doesn't hurt to have a T-Copter or two to carry the men around. The Aegis Warship is a hybrid of Advance Wars' cruiser and battleship. It moves six spaces and has two weapons, a direct combat anti-air Vulcan and an anti-ship missile with a very wide range of four to seven spaces. It does not attack ground units and does not promote. We're getting into the Navy units, so now's the time to mention Game War Wars 3 has a very expensive and inefficient Navy. The Aegis is just one example. It's very expensive and likely to be sunk by several pre-deployed enemy Aegis as soon as you deploy it. It can't attack ground units either. Want to deal with air units? Use fighters. For ships, use submarines. Game Boy Wars 3 has two sizes of aircraft carriers. Both serve similar functions. Air units can land on them and get fuel and repairs, like on an airport. Carriers also have anti-air missiles as weapons. Neither promotes. The small, less expensive carrier moves six spaces, carries two air units, and has a missile range of two to three spaces. The large, more expensive carrier moves five spaces, carries three air units, and has a missile range of four to six spaces. Neither is particularly defensive. These units would be great if it wasn't so easy to obliterate them with a submarine or Aegis warship. Nobody wants to spend this much money only to see it go down before it serves its purpose. Air units can get fuel through the supply plane. As for repairs, they can easily make it back to the airport. Also, the transport plane and tactical bomber are too big to land on the carriers, so that's unfortunate. The lander is a transportation ship. It moves four spaces and can carry any three land units. Tanks, infantry, cars, you name it. It has a light machine gun for defending itself if it's attacked on the beach, but it only really damages foot soldiers the most. Again, this thing is going to get sunk by enemy units, so I've always preferred the transport plane if I need land units carried over water. Four tiles is a really slow movement range, too. I haven't mentioned this, by the way, but it's totally possible to load a transporter that's carrying something onto landers and transport planes and unload it all in one turn for long-ranged attacks, so that's fun. Tankers carry fuel and ammo to your ships. Same rules as the supply plane and the supply truck apply, however the tanker cannot refuel submarines. It moves four spaces. By this point you've noticed a theme here, that I prefer ignoring the Navy entirely. While I would have recommended the tanker, save for the fact that it can't resupply the one Navy unit that probably needs it the most. So there really isn't much reason to use this thing, unless your Navy is that important to you. The submarine is unique in that nothing but the anti-subcopter and other submarines can attack it. The submarine is made to sink ships. It moves four spaces and its torpedoes are a ranged weapon, with a range of two to four spaces. 
This is the only C unit to promote, and it's a strange promotion. The ranged torpedo becomes a direct combat weapon, movement increases to 5 spaces, and it gains the ability to launch tactical bombs at range, like the tactical bomber had, except these can be fired at any tile up to 3 to 7 spaces away and explode from there. This is the only Navy unit I've ever used seriously, since it's safe from everything except the anti-subcopter and other submarines, unlike other ships. The tanker can't refuel it, so they have trouble getting more ammo far from the HQ, since you can't build a temporary port like in Days of Ruin. The promotion is one of the few that's questionable, since the range of the torpedo effectively decreases, but then the ranged tactical bomb lets you bomb the enemy HQ from relative safety. Anyways, I rarely earn enough EXP to promote it anyways. Keep two or three in your army exclusively for Navy battles. That's all for the main units and promoted units, but there are a few more units to discuss. Mercenary units. These were originally only available through the mobile adapter, and naturally the service is no longer online, so the mercenary units would normally be inaccessible. Luckily for us, there's a glitch in the system that allows us to recruit these special units. If you consider this a cheat, that's fine, you can win without mercenaries, but there is an achievement for recruiting all units at least once, so if you're looking to get it, here's the trick. First, find a comm tower and capture it. There will now be a link option in the menu. Open the menu, hold the select button, and choose the link option. Still holding select, choose a mercenary unit, watch the animation. The game will give an error, push A to cancel out. Now you can let go of the select button and place the new unit anywhere on the map it's normally allowed to move on. You've just recruited a mercenary unit, but are they worth it? Let's find out! The Mercenary Infantry is a special kind of infantry unit. It moves four spaces, can capture, and comes armed with a special hand grenade that can take out foot soldiers with ease. This unit is even able to swim across the ocean, the only foot soldier in the series to do so. As it moves far enough that it doesn't really need transporters and can even move over water, this is easily the finest foot soldier, though you have to choose between this and other mercenary units whenever you find a comm tower. Not to mention that the frail nature of the unit means that you can easily lose it, and the rarity of the mercenary units makes this loss particularly painful. The mercenary anti-air tank is uh, basically a more powerful, more defensive anti-air tank. It moves six spaces and is armed with the finest weapons available. Anti-air missiles and anti-tank cannon. This unit can do a lot, except get on transport planes. As stated, an air deterrent is critical to winning the later battles of the campaign, so this unit isn't a bad pick when you manage to pick up a comm tower. Remember, you can place it anywhere when you first recruit it. The mercenary tank is quite simply a stronger tank. It moves six spaces and boasts the highest attack and defense compared to other tanks. Like with the large tank, I can't really see the appeal here. I like the anti-air tank because it destroys air units without being an air unit itself. This unit destroys ground units, but it's also a ground unit. Not really recommended. The Mercenary Bomber is a bigger tactical bomber. It moves 11 spaces, and like Attacker S, it ignores the zone of control, so you can drop the bombs anywhere you want. I suppose if you're short on tactical bombers, you can deploy this beast for the same purpose instead. It does move farther after all. Still, not really sure it's such a great idea to spend the comm tower on this. The Mercenary Frigate is a ship with tactical bombs and an anti-air missile launcher. It moves seven spaces. The tactical bombs are ranged just like the promoted submarine, with a range of four to seven spaces. The anti-air missiles have a range of four to six spaces. This is the most defensive ship in the game. I actually like it quite a lot, since it's one of the best anti-air units and doesn't sink in one shot, but you should certainly get rid of Aegis and submarine threats before sending this ship out. You don't want to lose such a rare unit. And hey, if it runs low on ammo, the tanker might actually be a decent unit to pair the ship with. That concludes my overview of all units featured in Game Boy Wars 3. The campaign can be difficult to clear, but keep trying and you too can earn the coveted S-Rank ending. Good luck and have fun fighting!